All right, now we're recording. So for those of you that are watching this recording, I apologize for the mist of the beginning. We really just kind of jumped in at the beginning here with a, with a short recap from Monday, looking on unit dimensions, as well as talking a little bit about dimensional analysis. You know, it's, it's a really key concept, particularly when it comes to, I would argue these last two points here in terms of creating engineering formulas and confirming engineering calculations. I, I don't know how many times when I've been faced with a with a calculation or an issue where I don't I didn't wasn't really sure the best way to proceed, but by looking at the units associated with the values and data I had, you can kind of create that engineering formula to get an idea of a, a path forward. And at the same time, it becomes extremely important when doing calculations to have some, some form of secondary check to ensure the, the solution that you've arrived at makes sense and is, is accurate. And in addition to dimension analysis, one thing that we can discuss is dimensionless groups, which are for lack of a better definition, generalization if I could spell a phenomenon to approximate behavior, whether it be unit operations, chemical reactions, and just systems in general under specific conditions. And what I mean by that is, you know, if we're honest, engineers are, are fairly lazy to some degree. And so instead of having to do the most rigorous of calculations um, every single time, there are certain circumstances that arise when if you're looking for, you know, a quick approximation for some forms of conditions or values or, or chemical properties, use of dimensionless groups and relationships becomes extremely important because it allows you to essentially lump systems into standard modes so that you can make quick decisions or get good ideas of how things should behave. And, you know, these examples that we use could be, you know, some of these types of dimensionless groups. You know, we, we're familiar with some of these dimensionless numbers. Reynolds number, Nussel and Prandtl are really important as it relates to fluids and heat transfer. Um, Schmidt and Sherwood, as well as the Dom collar, more more so for heat tran or mass transfer. And so these values give an idea with just um, a, a small amount of information, uh, ways in which we can approximate ex anticipated behavior. And so it becomes um, extremely important to understand the importance of these dimensionless groups because they will come into play um, with significance later on in the semester. Any questions on that? Like I said, just touching base on these, these topics fairly lightly as, as it relates to some of the more detailed stuff that we'll get into here in a moment. No? All right. So let's talk now more specifically in terms of fluid mechanics. And we can't jump into discussions of fluid mechanics without first defining fluids for some or fluid. So, you know, I would ask you, what is a fluid? Anything that flows. All right, so I got anything that flows. Well, 
what else? What other definition do we could we have? And I apologize. My handwriting's terrible, not not even to mention this doing it on a tablet or a computer. Do we have another definition? Takes the shape of a container but doesn't fill it. That's more so for liquids, but it's it it loosely applies. Any other uh, ideas? Uh, it's matter that deforms under some kind of shear stress. Yes, that is the uh, the scientific definition. Yes, it's a substance that continuously deforms. One subject to a shear stress. Now the engineering definition, I, I would just argue liquids, vapors, and gases. And so with this large definition of a fluid, something that's going to deform when it's subject to a shear stress, I can categorize them um, into one of various categories depending on its physical and chemical properties. And so one of the properties that we look at is density. And looking at fluid density, I can define fluids in terms of them being incompressible or a compressible fluid. And an incompressible fluid has little to no change in density. with respect to changes in temperature and pressure. I hope I me mean, calling it TMP doesn't bother anybody too much. All right, so an incompressible fluid, and then of course a compressible fluid, we see significant changes. and density with respect to changes in temperature so what type of fluids do you think i would refer to when i'm talking about an incompressible fluid water or hydraulic fluid all right, water, hydraulic fluid are excellent examples. What about a compressible fluid? Any kind of gas. All right, any kind of gas. Yeah, so I can, I can crudely approximate most liquids as incompressible fluids and most vapors and gases as compressible fluids. Now there are going to be some exceptions. However, like I said, this isn't a science class, this is an engineering class. And so, like I said, making these assumptions are reasonable. However, when you're looking at large fluctuations in pressure and large fluctuations in temperature, which I'll admit is a very relative statement, um, liquids can demonstrate um, issues in compressibility where corrections may need to be made to some of the engineering formulas that we will discuss and derive here later on. However, for the most part, when we're talking about an incompressible fluid, you can safely assume that we're really thinking about liquids, 
when we're here talking about fluid mechanics. Nine times out of 10, we're talking about water. And when we're looking at compressible fluids, we're, we're mainly talking about vapors, gases. A lot of times, it's nine times out of, I wouldn't say six times out of 10, it's, it's air or natural gas um, in terms of our discussions and examples, just because those are gonna be the most common things you, you'll encounter in a process. So with that, let's have a quick discussion. Looking at the implications of compressibility. Oh, that's ugly. All right, I need to get a better pen. So let's say I have flow through a pipe. Fluid comes in on the left, fluid goes out on the right. My question for you all is what happens to pressure as a fluid moves through the pipe. If I have, let's say I call this P1, and maybe I'll say P1 question mark. What happens to the pressure? All right, I can, I can probably define it as P2. Um, you, it should develop a pressure gradient through the pipe. Okay, so is, is P1 gonna be greater than P2? Is P1 gonna be equal to P2? Or is P1 gonna be less than P2? Here, look, let's play a game, everybody's favorite game in my classes. Uh, it's rock, paper, scissors. All right, nice. This is this is the moment you've all been waiting for. If you think P1 is greater than P2, you can show me rock or you can chat it for those that are facing issues with their camera. And if you think they equal you can say paper, and if you think that P1 is less than P2, you can say scissors. So what do you think? I know maybe we'll do one later on in the semester where we can bring Lizard and Spock in the equation. All right, I see some, some scissors. P1's less than P2, I see some rocks, some, some really strong, good old Mexico City vibes, I like it. All right, well the answer is rock, in that the pressure at the entrance is greater than the pressure at the exit. And we'll discuss the reason for that when we, when we jump into energy balance here in a week or so. But we see that the pressure goes up or falls as we flow through the pipe. What do you think that means? Or what do you think that happens to density? Or how does this pressure change influence fluid density. Let's look here it at the depends, big. It depends on the fluid type, if it's compressible or not, I think. Oh, you're right. So it depends, right? The answer to every question 
that you'll you may face in life is it depends right so incompressible and compressible right it depends what happens if it's compressible what's what the, what is the density going to do and it decreases decrease. so it's going to the density is going to decrease in an incompressible fluid Is that what I heard? Incompressible is probably not going to change very much. I thought you asked for uh, uh, compressible. That should change, but for incompressible, the density shouldn't change at all. Okay. So you guys, you guys are largely right there on the money, right? So if it's incompressible, we, we already stated a little bit ago that we're not going to see a whole lot of changes with respect to temperature and pressure. It's compressible fluids that's going to be largely affected. So incompressible fluid, density, which is largely defined as rho, will not change. And I, I guess I'm going to go ahead and, and apologize now, because in this class, there's going to be a whole lot of pressures and densities, as well as heat and flow rate. So there's a, going to be a lot of P's and Q's and you may not understand what P I'm referring to or what P, uh, row I'm referring to because because they look the same a lot of times when I write it. So never hesitate to 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 ask for that clarification. But however, for a compressible fluid, the density will change, and and the density that's a that's a terrible row. However, the density will decrease. Right, because there's less pressure um, being exerted by that by that gas, and so when we when we start talking about these mass and, and energy balances, that fluctuation in density has a very significant effect on on vapors and gases. And it, and it creates a lot of really interesting phenomena that we'll talk about. But I, I want you for now to just kind of keep this, oh look, more stuff disappeared, um, in the back of your mind in terms of, you know, what's that gonna mean long-term? And from that, let's let's jump to one more property and then we'll, we'll probably um, start talking a little bit about statics which we may, may end up finishing on Friday. And the next property I like to discuss is fluid viscosity. Now fluid viscosity variations are, are a little different than the density variations, primarily because when we look at viscosity, we lump fluids into one of several categories. However, for the purpose of this class, I've, I can narrow it down into two categories. The first one being a Newtonian fluids. And the second category aptly named non-Newtonian fluids. So a Newtonian fluid is, is one, or I can say it's a fluid that exhibits a constant viscosity as a function of the shear stress it's exerted subject to. In writing that out mathematically, I can say the viscosity of the fluid and the shear stress that, that results has this sort of relationship where the shear stress that's resulting from that fluid is a function of the velocity and this relationship in terms of the derivative of that fluid's, fluid's 
flow velocity uh, with respect to um, some length or distance. And if you look in your unit operations textbook, I believe it's in the beginning of chapter three. I honestly am not sure why. You'll see a figure, and this is figure, I think, three, two, which has on the y-axis the velocity gradient here, du dy, as well as the shear stress. And from that, the Newtonian fluids follow a nice, simple, linear relationship. And fluids that don't follow this relationship or dependence, we lump into the category of non-Newtonian fluids. where we say the fluid has variable viscosity as a function of shear stress. And there's, there's a lot of categories. You can have non-Newtonian fluids that have this um, less less than expected shear, some with higher than expected shear, and, and as that gradient increases, the shear goes up. As the um, velocity gradient goes up, you see less shear. And there's you know some that there's actually almost a a delay in shear, and then it uh, obeys a Newtonian fluid. However, there's a minimum de degree of shear that has to be exerted for the fluid to essentially flow. And these, these are one of several categories in terms of whether they're considered shear thinning or shear thickening type fluids. And table three, one in the text discusses them in a little bit more. I, we don't really get into them very much because the modifications for the calculations tend to be a little cumbersome. And most fluids you encounter in a, in a processing format are going to exhibit Newtonian behavior. And in the event that you encounter non-Newtonian fluids, um, a lot of systems and companies often rely on empirical models uh, to adapt in their in their systems because the empirical models they'll develop will just be far more accurate than, than the adaptations that you see in some of the more theoretical type equations. And so simply put, we, we, we really stick to Newtonian here in this class. Uh, when it gets to non-Newtonian, that, that becomes to be a little bit more of a, a grad level discussion that uh, we don't really just don't get into. One last thing I'll, I'll jump in on is is that discussion of of stress, which which we can we can define a lot of ways, right? Y'all are in college, especially you seniors, you'll you'll really learn what stress is. But in terms of a classical scientific sense, I mean, we say stress is a force divided by an area upon which it asks, which it acts. And there's two types of stress. There's normal stress, or stress that is exerted perpendicular to a surface. Oof, I got ugly at the end.
and their shear stress, which acts parallel to a surface. And this means that any force that's exerted on a surface can be broken down into both a shear stress and a normal stress. We call normal stress pressure because that's just the convention. So pressure is um, an extremely important concept in fluids particularly when it comes to a discussion of gauge pressure versus an absolute pressure. Now, more often than not, you have the inclination to use the absolute pressure in calculations because it's you know quote unquote the most detailed and the most the most correct if depending on who you ask however when doing engineering calculations more often than not it's more effective and simpler to simply use um the gauge pressure and and, and well there's, there's one of several reasons, primarily because when we're, we're looking at pressure and we're wanting to understand forces and energy, more often than not, it's, it's the delta that becomes the, the key important, particularly when we do energy balances. We often are analyzing a fluid as a function of one state versus a second state. And so in those, um, systems and when doing those uh, analyses, the actual absolute pressure does, does really nothing for us. And by using a gauge pressure, the, it makes the calculations a lot more reasonable and those comparisons a lot more effective. And so you'll see this come up um, several times when we start talking about fluids. So it's just important to keep it in mind. But at the same time, it's also important to make sure that it's explicitly clear when running your calculations, whether you're using um, a gauge comparison or an absolute comparison. Because once again, communication, you don't want to have someone really confused and, and not understand what it is you're actually um, showing um, in your calculations. So I'm going to stop there for a second. Um, are there any questions, things I can clarify? Everybody, everybody doing well, following along okay. And they need to have a, a mechanism where the, where the names in the black can just like move up and down or shake left and right. That would be kind of cool. That would be kind of cool. All right, let's see if I can find my next page. All right. So with that, I want us to jump into a discussion on fluid statics. Now, you guys have all been exposed to some form of uh, presentation on fluid statics. Is that correct? I know it shows up in Felder and Rousseau a little bit. However, I'm not really sure if Dr. O teaches it. Or maybe it's in, in 101. It really depends on who teaches those classes, right? However, this is a fluid mechanics course, and I think it's important to, to, to recover it at, at least in, in, in brief. So let's look at fluid statics or the hydrostatics, primarily initially at liquids, then we'll adapt this to uh, gases and compressible fluids and see how it varies. So if I say I have a column of fluid
I have some form of pressure exerting itself at the top of that fluid. And I have another pressure exerting itself on the bottom of that fluid. And this column is of a certain height, which I can describe as, as a Z, or if I want to be fancy and mathy, I can, I can make it a, a slice and call it a DZ. And then I can ask myself, what is the difference between the pressure that we see at the top of this column of fluid and the pressure that we see at the bottom of this fluid? Well, one way that I can analyze this is in terms of a, of a force balance, so to speak, where if, if the, the force is simply the pressure times the area upon which it acts, I can say, well, to find this difference in pressure, I can say P at the top, if I say this is zero, and then the top is Z times area minus the pressure over this area. is equal to what? Well, that pressure is going to be largely a function of the weight of this fluid that we see. And so what we, we state is that we have the density of the fluid times area times delta C plus the density times the area times delta C times gravity. And we can do some manipulation here or a little bit of canceling. Everything's got an area. So we can get rid of that. What we're left with is PZ minus PZ plus delta Z is equal to now oh, I think I forgot something here. Checking my notes. This would be, uh, I see this, my value. Okay, so we're looking at these two heights. We're looking at the differences in pressure. So at the top of the column, we actually don't have any pressure or don't have any weight of the fluid. So one of these terms should go to zero actually. It's the second term. And this one should be a negative, such that when we do this, see just delta C over DC, we get this result. Or we can manipulate this a little bit into an expression that looks like this, DP, DC equals negative rho G or P is equal to P naught, minus rho G Z, depending on the convention for height. 
So let me recap what I've what I've written here and explain it a little more slowly. So we're looking at the differences in pressure at one height, which is the top of the column over the bottom of the column. And so what we need to look at is a comparison of the weight of the fluid at the top of the column and at the bottom of the column. At the top of the column, there is no fluid, so there is no weight. And at the bottom of the column, the weight of the fluid is essentially the mass of the fluid times gravity, which we can approximate times the area of that fluid times the density of that fluid times the height, which area and height gives you volume, density gives you mass, times gravity. So if I make that comparison, and I'll use some color to make sense, here at the top and here at the bottom, I should be left with simply the weight of this differential slice, or rho g dz. Doing that, dividing it by that differential gives me this gradient dp dz, which is simply equivalent to the density and gravity solving for the integral, what I'm left with is the hydrostatic equation. Keeping in mind, this is only applicable for incompressible fluids. Any questions on that? So what does this fluid static equation tell us? Well, it, it, it tells us that the pressure of a fluid varies linearly with height, where the lower into a fluid the greater the pressure. Exerted. Simply because there's more weight on top of that fluid. And so the weight of that fluid creates the pressure that is exhibited by that fluid. So how th is this applied? Well, several ways. But a simple application or device for this comes in the form of pressure measuring devices. And a good example of this is what's known as a manometer. Now a manometer is a device that measures pressure differences between fluids based on the principles of fluid statics. Right, so using those principles and those height differences, what hap we can construct and interpret what we see from a manometer. So a simple example may be a system here, where let's say I've got some sort of, I don't know, a pressure vessel. and it's exerting some pressure, P, 
on this in this device. And then I've got a secondary reference reference fluid. A lot of times it was traditionally uh, mercury was used because of its extremely high density, small fluctuations in a mercury height, and a manometer um, allowed large pressure values to be read. And it was pretty re extremely reliable, um, but you didn't have to construct extremely large manometers. However, we now know better about mercury and that it's probably not the best thing to have lying around. And so more often than not, um, oil-based manometers are used when, when necessary. And so this system would exert this pressure on this side. And a lot of times you can have an open or closed manometer on the secondary side, but let's say this is atmospheric. And so the relative height difference gave you some indication of the pressure exerted in that unknown pressure in that pressure vessel, where this would be the density of that reference fluid, gravity, and then the height difference seen between both sides of the manometer. Does that explanation clear? Is there anything I can do to further uh, clear that up? Okay, then let's let's end the day with a, a little example. So let me jump back. No, I don't like that one. Do you guys see this one? So this one asks yes. to calculate the pressure at point A where we have mercury in the bottom of this manometer. We assume that the right side of that manometer is just open to the atmosphere. And we want to calculate the pressure at point A in that oil tank. Um, let's say in, in gauge pressure to make things a little easier. So the question then becomes, how do we calculate that pressure? Well, the specific gravity of the oil is 0.91. The distance from A to B is 7.22. And the distance from B to C is one foot. So I'll give you guys a few seconds to kind of read it, look at the figure again, and then I'll jump over to my uh, uh, whiteboard and let's see if we can kind of work on this one together. Okay. So, I'm going to make it where it should be a little easier to see that picture, but we can still work on this example together. So, how's that? So, we want to find the pressure at point A. So, what do we need to do? Any ideas? Find the pressure at B from the height difference. Okay. So we know the pressure differential from A to B is what? One inch of mercury. 
one foot of mercury, excuse me. Well, we have to consider the change in height from A to B, don't we? Yes, we need to consider. So it's it's rho g of some height, right? Yeah. Where this rho is going to be for oil. Gravity is gravity. I don't need a moniker there. And this height is going to be 7.22 feet. And now we, we can also look at comparison of pressure B to C, which is rho GH. Now this is mercury. Oh my gosh, sorry. And this height is one foot. So how can we take these two things together and calculate the pressure at point A? Well, it looks like uh, the point at C is open to the atmosphere, so you know mm -hmm. there's zero gauge pressure there. So there's zero gauge pressure um, at the top of C, right? Because it's open to the atmosphere. And so if I move down into the mercury, is the pressure going to increase or decrease? Increase. Okay. So going from C to B, this pressure is going to increase, right? So I can say this is a positive value for the sake of my argument. Now, there's there's the discussion of, you know, moving around from point B to point B. However, in that situation, I'm going down to the bottom of the manometer and going back up to point B. So on both sides of the manometer, the height at point B is gonna have the same pressure. So now if I'm moving from B to A, is the pressure going to increase or decrease? It's gonna decrease. It's gonna decrease. And so what that means is if I want to find the pressure at A, I'm looking at the pressure from C to B minus the pressure from A to B. Because going from C to B increases pressure, then going from B to A decreases pressure. And yes, I can throw an atmospheric, but if I want to say gauge, I can neglect that value entirely. And so to calculate that, I can say rho two G H two minus rho one G H one, which equals the density of mercury is 13.6. And that's um, S G, it's a specific gravity, which is a comparison of density to a reference standard, which for liquids is going to be water. And the density of water, we got feet, so we're probably going to have to use metric, or excuse me, English units. So the density of water is 62.4 pound mass per cubic feet. The height, or gravity, excuse me, is 32.2 feet per second squared. The height is one foot minus that second uh, term in my expression, which is going to be 0.891 times 6.2, excuse me, 62.4 pound mass per cubic feet times 32.2 feet per second squared times 7.22 feet. So doing this calculation, and I, I know I'm over time. I apologize if you have a class right after mine. You Feel free to leave and watch this later. What I'm left with is 14,125 
pound mass. per foot second squared. Now this unit, since we're looking at pressure, is, is mainly garbage, which means we're probably going to need to do some sort of unit conversion. And what we need is to divide by the G sub C constant, which is 32.2 pound mass feet per pound force second squared, and then convert my feet squared to inches squared. So I have in one foot squared, I have 144 square inches. And this means, to double check those units, like I said, it's always important. Feet squared's gone, second squared's gone. I'm left with pound force per inches squared, or PSI, and that's gauge. And if I do that calculation, I should be left with about 3.05 PSIG, which, spoiler alert for those of you that read really carefully on this, the answer of B was right here. <laughs> so any questions on that example? Dr. Lopez, I have a question. Of course. Uh, isn't the sixty isn't the sixty two point four number already in units of pound force per foot cube? So you wouldn't have to use the acceleration of gravity. No, they're in units of pound mass per cubic foot. Okay. That's the tricky thing when it comes to English, is you have to convert between pound mass and pound force often. I but thought we is, were solving for the pressure at A. We did solve for the pressure at A. Wasn't the 3.05 the same as the pressure of B on your table or on your slideshow? No, no, I said in my notes that I had there on that slideshow, I said the answer, because it, it was a multiple choice, oh, was okay, B. Yeah, I misunderstood. Yeah. No, you're fine. So any qu other questions? These, these are all good questions. I appreciate it. If not, I won't, I won't uh, take up too much of else every time. I'm sure you have other things that you need to attend to in terms of studying and, and class and things. But thank you all for attending once again. And I look forward to seeing you all on Friday. I'm, I will hop over to office hours now between 11 and noon. So if you have questions on homework, feel free to stop by. Take care, guys, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Thank Lopez. You. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye.